Okay, so next, let me briefly talk about the importance of philosophy in general, and then philosophy of science in particular. So I already mentioned the four Kantian questions, and my general outlook in terms of the primacy of practical philosophy. Let me try to bring this closer to home, so to speak. So I would say that philosophy, the way I understand it, begins with a very particular, very peculiar experience. And I should also say, I think it is a very rare experience. I would describe it as a pause, as a suspension of the regular course of events, as an interruption in the usual state of affairs, a timeout or a pause, whereby an individual, so to speak, takes a break from the rush of everyday life, and asks themselves, what are they doing, and why are they doing it? So, phenomenologically speaking, that is to say, from the standpoint of our inner experience, we wake up in the morning, often to an alarm clock, always short on time, always rushing somewhere. Taking a break, in this sense, is actually, I think, an enormous luxury. And what makes this break philosophical is not merely the state of idleness, but a state of reflection. I mean, again, the vast majority of people, when they do take a break, because they're tired or depressed, they are in no mood and in no position to reflect attentively and carefully on their situation. So if one were to take a pause and reflect, what would they find? Let me make a very strong claim. This claim is largely due to the great German philosopher Martin Heidegger, whom we'll study later in the course. So Heidegger would say that the fundamental experience of our human existence is an experience of groundlessness and anxiety in the following sense. All of our experience is essentially structured in a temporal fashion. We are, so to speak, tied between the past and the future. And if we reflect on our temporal situation, again carefully and attentively, we will realize that what we have in the past is not a clear or a transparent point of departure or origin, but something vague, indeterminate, indefinite, amorphous. As Brian McGee puts it, we always already find ourselves emerging from the unconsciousness of an earlier period in time. So if I think back and ask myself, why am I standing here and recording this lecture? I remember having emerged from the unconsciousness of today's early morning, presumably from the unconsciousness of sleep, but also from a different perspective. In a broader sense, I always already find myself emerging from the unconsciousness of early babyhood, always already finding myself thrown into this world, always already finding myself with certain beliefs, certain desires, finding myself in a certain body with particular dispositions, but also, very importantly, finding myself without a manual without a clear instruction as to what I should do. Now, to be sure, people will claim that this or that book or this or that person has it all figured out. But these quote-unquote manuals come without a factory stamp, so to speak, in a sense that it is always a matter of our free conscious choice to accept, let's say, a particular teaching as authoritative, but such choice always remains provisional, always open to revision. And in this sense, our existence is always an issue for us. We cannot choose to not care about our existence. And again, as to the particular choices that we make, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that these choices were our choices, which is to say that we could have chosen otherwise. And there's always bound to be a lingering doubt on whether we have made the right choice or not. But even more dramatically, about these choices, if we do ask ourselves, 
why we have made a certain particular choice, at the end of the day, the real answer is unknown to us. So again, I am recording this lecture. But why am I recording it? I could give you a story that giving lectures is an essential part of my vocation as a professional philosopher. Maybe I find it enjoyable. Maybe being a university professor gives one a certain measure of social esteem. But why do I care about esteem? Or why do I find philosophy pleasurable? At some point, the answer boils down to just, this is the situation I find myself in. These are the dispositions I find myself with. But I don't have the slightest idea as to why. A very disconcerting fact indeed. So this is the universal experience of groundlessness that Heidegger points to. Parenthetically, let me just mention that I think that to some extent this captures the timeless appeal of Plato's dialogues. Socrates goes around Athens, often talking to successful, highly esteemed citizens, and Socrates asks them to give an account of their life. And time and time again, especially in the so-called aporetic, allegedly early, dialogues, the Athenians find themselves driven into a corner, unable to respond, forced to agree with the Socrates' disconcerting conclusion that he knows that he knows nothing, and neither do they. But it gets even worse, because we were just talking about time. So there's a point in the past, but obviously there's also a point in the future. So what does future hold? Well, we all live in a shadow, in the expectation of death. Death, this interesting and strange word. A word which seemingly refers to something that can never truly be a part of our experience. In a sense that if I am truly dead, there is no me to experience this death. But, of course, in an indirect fashion, I see, often tragically and lamentably, other people die. And, in general, there is something akin to death in the mere passage of time. Plants, animals, people, getting old, getting sick, dying. Artifacts, getting worn out, old, broken. And, in a general sense, moments of time irretrievably passing away. So this, according to Heidegger, is our fundamental experience, strung between indeterminate groundlessness of the past and the indeterminate anxiety in the future, without a clear point of departure and without a clear destination. And maybe most importantly, without a manual, without a map or a compass. In many ways, an awesome challenge. And I would say that to do philosophy essentially is to take up this challenge, to have the courage to think for yourself, not to rely on shortcuts or cop-outs, not to lose ourselves in the busyness of everyday life, but to look squarely at these questions and to try our best to provide adequate answers to these questions in full realization of the limited nature of human knowledge and of human cognition, understanding that at best one can provide only a tentative answer, necessarily open to criticism and subject to revision. Let us go back and once again meditate on Kant's four questions. Hopefully now they will make slightly more sense. What should I do? What can I know? What can I hope for? The three questions reducible to the fourth most fundamental question. What am I?